The book of Daniel chapter 1, as we have come to this, one of the most exciting books of the Old Testament to me. I love the book of Daniel. And uh, we're going to just go slow through the book of Daniel. They announced two chapters this morning, but uh, they are so rich, we're just going to take one chapter at a time going through Daniel so that you can fully absorb uh, the marvelous prophecies uh, of this book of Daniel. And like me, I trust that you'll fall in love with this uh, man of God who lived such a beautiful and exemplary life. Uh, I've come to just love Daniel as a person. I, he's one of those that I'm looking forward to meeting when I get to heaven. I want to know what his feelings were when he was in the lion's den and, uh, uh, and just the whole thing, you know, and just an exciting, exciting man of God. Now, the book of Daniel has given tremendous fits uh, to the critics of the Bible. Those who seek to deny that the Bible is divinely inspired of God Probably one of the books that is really the thorn in their side more than any other is the book of Daniel. Because Daniel predicted events that were going to transpire uh, during the uh, time of the uh, Greeks, Seleucids, and uh, the Ptolemies and all, that were so exact, speaking of the uh, Cleopatra and others, and he was so exact in his prophecies, so precise, that critics of the Bible and those who do not believe that the Bible is inspired of God have had great difficulty with Daniel and they finally found the solution that Daniel wasn't written by Daniel. Uh, that some fellow later on, after the events took place, wrote the book of Daniel and signed it as Daniel, but he was really a forger because it would be impossible to write with such exactness of the events of the future and unless you were there after they had taken place. So uh, to discredit the book of Daniel, they have the late date authorship theory uh, by which they have sought to discredit it. But there are so many, so many holes in that theory, it isn't even worthwhile looking at. But if you say nothing else, this should suffice. But with those kind of people, nothing suffices. Uh, but Jesus made reference to the book of Daniel and he ascribed the authorship to Daniel. So it, that, that should be sufficient to answer any uh, criticism or any kind of a late date fraud kind of a thing that might have been going on because Jesus would not have endorsed a fraud. And so... Uh, Suffice it to say, I'm not going to go into all the arguments, it, it isn't even worth it. I think that too many times people try to fight uh, the darkness, you know, and uh, always trying to drive out darkness. That, that's, that can be just a tremendous expenditure of energy and time. Rather than drive out darkness, just turn on the light. <laughs> you know, and the light will dispel the darkness. And so... Uh, Let's just look at the light and turn on the light. I, I don't like to, to major in the minors or uh, into the negative things, but just uh, to just rejoice in the glorious light that God has given to us. Now, Daniel begins the book. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. Now,
In the third year of Jehoiakim, it is thought that Jehoiakim began to reign in about 607 B.C. So the third year of his reign would, of course, be about 604 B.C. And there is no direct record in history of Babylon attacking Jerusalem in 604 B.C. And thus the, the dating has been brought into question. But if you turn to 2 Kings chapter 24, where we read of the reign of Jehoiakim, it says, In his days Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came up, and Jehoiakim became his servant for three years. Now Jehoiakim was more or less set on the throne by Nebuchadnezzar. He was a vassal to Babylon. Uh, actually, he was uh, set on the throne by Pharaoh Necho, but uh, then uh, the Pharaoh was conquered by, uh, uh, by Babylon. But the third year, he rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar. And the Lord sent against him bands of the Chaldees, or the Babylonians, and bands of the Syrians, and bands of the Moabites, and bands of the children of Ammon. This would be the third year after. But notice, and he sent them against Judah to destroy it, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by his servants, the prophets. And uh, so uh, it says, Surely the commandment of the Lord came upon Judah to remove them out of his sight, for the sins of Manasseh, according to all that he did. And uh, thus, in the third year, uh, the, they came against Jerusalem, and it was probably at this time that they took certain of the vessels from the house of God, and these captives uh, of the king's descendants back to Babylon. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into the hand with part of the vessels, not all of them at this time, later they were all taken, but part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And the king spoke to Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and the princes. So uh, they brought some of the choice uh, young men. Now, uh, again, let's go back to 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 18. And uh, we have a prophecy here of Isaiah that he is giving to uh, Hezekiah the king and the occasion was Hezekiah almost died and uh, the he recovered from this illness you remember the story how that uh, the prophet came to him and said, set your house in order because you're going to die and not live. And Hezekiah prayed all night long and begged God. And so the Lord uh, added 10 years, he gave him another 10 years. And uh, so in recovering from this illness, uh, certain emissaries came from Babylon to congratulate him on the recovery from this illness. And so as a gracious host, Hezekiah took them through all of the treasures that were in the house of the Lord, and, and he showed them everything that he had. And uh, so when they left, the prophet Isaiah came to him and he said, you know, 
uh, did these fellows come from Babylon? Yes. And uh, what did you show them? He said, I showed them everything, all of the treasures and all that are here. And so Isaiah said unto him, verse 16, Hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days will come that all that is in your house and that which your fathers have laid up in store, all of the treasures, shall be carried into Babylon, and nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. And of thy sons, that is the king's sons, his descendants, that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, they shall take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Now this is a prophecy a hundred years before. Now this prophecy is being fulfilled when Daniel and other of the princes uh, were taken then to Babylon. And so they chose children, and notice children, in whom was no blemish, but well-favored or good-looking and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace whom they might teach the learning and the language of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat. So these young men were taken as captives. They were descendants of Hezekiah. And thus they were of the royal seed. Daniel was of the royal seed from the tribe of Judah, a descendant of David, one of the royal seed. Now, oh, the thought that I was going to give you fled from me. But it'll come back. Don't worry. Well, it'll come back later. <laughs> you know, it's fun growing old. <laughs> so the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank. And so he nourished them for three years, and at the end that they might stand before the king. So they were being groomed, taught in all of the learning of Babylon, taught the Chaldean language, uh, the provision of the king's fare, the king's meat and so forth was set before them, and they were to be prepared to stand before the king as a counselor, uh, in the, uh, the, the foreign affairs department, especially dealing with the nation of Judah. Now, the, the interesting thing is that Daniel and his three friends were probably around 14 years old at this time. Uh, so many times I think that our Sunday school papers uh, give us sort of a false impression with ages. Uh, for instance, when Abraham was commanded of the Lord to offer his son Isaac, his only son, as a sacrifice to the Lord on the mount in which God would show him, we so often see the pictures of Abraham leading this little boy, maybe 8 to 12 years old. But uh, Isaac at the time could have been as much as 30 years old. And, and so we get false impressions. Uh, here, you know, Daniel is usually pictured as, uh, you know, a very mature young fellow, but he was probably only about 14 years old because... He was taken 
in the third year of Jehoiakim as a captive, and he lived through the 70 years of captivity in Babylon that was predicted by Jeremiah, and he lived on into the reign of the Medo-Persian kings, actually unto Darius. And it, when he was thrown in the lion's den, no longer a young man, he was in his 90s uh, when he was thrown into the lion's den. And it could be he was just such a tough old critter by that time, the lions didn't have any desire for him, you know. Uh, but uh, uh, but you know, our minds, it's like listening to a, 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 a person on the radio. Somehow you get a picture in your mind of what they must look like. And then when you meet them, it's always a shock. Um, and it's sort of fun because uh, I'll be in a restaurant someplace and when I order my dinner, the uh, waiter or the waitress will often take a double take. And they'll say, you're not, could you be, oh no. Are you Chuck Smith? And I'll say, yes. Oh my, you know, and you can see the shock on their face. Uh, you sort of want to say like uh, Jesus said concerning John, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? You know, I mean, what were you expecting to see? And, uh, and so it's interesting how we conjure in our minds pictures, you know, uh, Daniel being thrown into the lion's den. You think of him still as a kid, uh, but uh, he was a uh, old man in his 90s by that time. And so... Uh, he was probably about 14 to 17 years old when he was taken with his friends as captive to Babylon. Now, among those that were taken of the children of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Now, you remember that they were taken during a time of spiritual decadence in Israel. Josiah, the good king, had died. Jehoiakim, a wicked king, was reigning in his stead. The spiritual atmosphere in Jerusalem was not good. The prophet Jeremiah was speaking out against these things that were going on. But it is very probable that Daniel, as a very young boy, was impressed by this prophet Jeremiah, the man of God. His heart was open to the message of Jeremiah and sympathetic, though the whole political scene was that of corruption Yet uh, there was this young man, in fact, these four young men who were really committed uh, to the Lord at an early age. Now, the name Daniel means God is my judge. Hananiah means beloved of the Lord. Michel means who is as God. And Azariah means, the Lord is my help. Beautiful names that signify the uh, depth of spirituality, perhaps, of their parents when their boys were named, to give them these names that relate to the Lord. Now, they were given to, these young men were placed under the charge of the prince of the eunuchs, and he gave them names. Babylonian names. To Daniel, he gave the name of Belshazzar or Belteshazzar, which is the same as Belshazzar. And uh, the name means Bel's prince or servant. Uh, to Hananiah, whose name meant beloved of the Lord, he gave the name... Shadrach, which, of course, 
is illumined by Rak, who was the sun god of the Babylonians. To Michelle, whose name means who is as God, he gave the name of Meshach, and the, that means who is as Shak. So who is as God was changed to who is as Shak, who was uh, thought to be Venus, uh, the goddess Venus, uh, the Babylonian equivalent of the Greek god Venus. And to Azariah, whose name meant the Lord is my help, they gave the name Abednego, which is servant of Nego, another of the Babylonian gods. And so they were given by the Babylonians these pagan names. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat nor with the wine which he drank. And therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Purposed in his heart not to defile himself. I think it is so important for people to establish in their hearts that kind of commitment and purpose that I'm not going to defile my body. Another one of my favorite characters in the Old Testament is Joseph. And he, at a tender young age, had a very bitter experience. His brothers turned on him and sold him to slave traders who were going to Egypt. In Egypt, he was sold to a man by the name of Potiphar, who was one of the chief guards of the Pharaoh. Potiphar's wife, took a liking to him and sought to seduce him into a sexual relationship. But it said, Joseph said unto her, How can I do this great sin against God? So though a teenager, though in a strange country where the Influences of, of the home are gone. The opportunity is there. Yet because of that purpose in their hearts, they remain true to the Lord. A lot of times people, when they are away from the influences and the environment of their own home, get into evil. They, they do things there that they wouldn't do at home because they think, well, nobody knows me here and, and all. And, and that's where a lot of times people get tripped up and get into mischief when they get away from the environment of home. But here were these young fellows and they had purposed in their hearts to be pure, not to defile themselves. And how important it is for us to make that kind of purpose and determination. I'm not going to defile myself. I'm going to live a pure and holy life before God. I'm not going to pollute my mind. I'm not going to defile my body. Now, the king's meat, most generally, was first of all sacrificed to their gods in pagan worship. And then after the meat was sacrificed to the gods, it was then uh, roasted and, and, and fed at the king's, it served at the king's table. This was a common practice among the pagans. In Paul's day, uh, he writes concerning this practice. 
and how that uh, when you go to the butcher shop to buy meat, he said, don't ask the butcher, was this meat offered as a sacrifice? Because if the butcher says yes, then if you buy it and eat it, your conscience is going to be troubled. So just don't ask. Just buy it and take it home and enjoy it, you know. And don't ask questions for your conscience' sake. And when you're invited to a friend's house to eat, who is an unbeliever, just eat what is set before you asking no questions. Same idea. Don't say, did you take this down and sacrifice it to the, you know, to the God before you brought it home to serve me? And, uh, just don't ask questions. Eat what is set before you asking no questions uh, for your conscience sake. Now, there was no doubt that the meat that was upon the king's table was offered first unto the gods of the Babylonians. And because of the law of God, to eat that meat would be to pollute yourself. And so Daniel purposed in his heart he wasn't going to defile his body, himself, with the king's meat or with the king's wine. And so he requested from the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. He was a good-looking, model kind of a young man. And, and the man who was in charge of grooming him loved him. He was just that kind of a, of a person. And uh, he, there was this special relationship. It, he liked Daniel very much. And so he said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king, and well might he. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar was a man who uh, didn't take no for an answer. He was a man who would order you executed uh, for any trivial offense. And so this fellow, uh, like everyone else, served in great fear. And, and so he declares, I fear the, uh, my lord, the king, who has appointed your meat and your drink. The king is the one that's ordered this stuff for you. For why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort? You're going to make me endanger my own head, man, to the king. I mean, he'll, he'll, he'll chop off my head if you guys come in looking sickly and all because I'm in charge of you know, of, of feeding you and getting you strong and healthy and training you and all. And uh, you're putting my life in jeopardy. So Daniel said to Melzar, who was the prince of the eunuchs that had been set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, prove your servants, I beg you, for 10 days. Now, as you know, there are... Uh, certain numbers that have uh, spiritual implications. Uh, the, the study of biblical numerology is interesting, uh, and numbers are symbolic in the scriptures. And the number 10 is symbolic of testing and trial. Now, you remember when Jacob was serving his uncle Laban for his wives. Jacob said unto him, You've changed my wages ten times. The testing, the trial. When Job addressed those fellows who had come to commiserate with him in his physical afflictions, he said, you've actually castigated me these ten times. Number of testing. 
You remember when Jesus wrote to the church of Smyrna in the book of Revelation, he said, and uh, you will be tested for 10 days. The number of testing and trial. So Daniel said, prove your servants for 10 days. Give us a 10-day test. And let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. And then after 10 days, take a look at our faces. And uh, the others who eat the portion of the king's meat. And as you see, then deal with your servants. So he consented to them in this matter, and he proved them for ten days. And at the end of the ten days, their countenance appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all of the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink, and he gave them the vegetables, the vegetarian type of a diet. And as for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all of the learning and wisdom. So the knowledge came from God. They were gifted by God. Now, to me, it is, it's just fascinating to see how certain people are gifted in certain areas. Gifted musicians. You know, you could practice the piano all your life. Eight hours a day. But you'd never be able to play like Mark Zeman. That's a gift. And there are people who are just gifted musically. People who are gifted in linguistics. People who are gifted in mathematics. There's just something in the genes. But it is God who placed it in the genes. And so these gifts actually come from God. These abilities come from God. And it is a wise person who recognizes that this is a gift from God, this capacity, this ability, and he then gives it back to God to glorify God with that gift that he has. You see, our gifts always find their highest use and expression when they are used for the glory of God then the purposes are being fulfilled. It's a tragic thing when people prostitute those gifts and use them for their own glory or for their own enrichment rather than for the glory of God. That's always a very sad and tragic thing, but it's such a common thing. People will take those natural abilities, capacities that God has given to them and then use them for themselves. Now... These four children, God gave to them the knowledge and the skill in all of the learning and the wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. His went beyond just uh, the knowledge and understanding of the sciences and uh, things of this nature. And God gave to Daniel this spiritual dimension. Uh, and it is, I believe, a direct correlation between this spiritual capacities with that commitment that Daniel had made and purposed in his heart that he wasn't going to defile himself. I'm going to keep my body pure. I'm going to keep my life pure. I'm not going to defile myself. And I believe there's a direct relationship between that commitment towards purity and the gifts of the Spirit in the discerning and the understanding of, of dreams and, and visions, that they are tied together with that kind of a commitment uh, unto the Lord. Now, at the end of the days, that would be the three years, the king had said that he should bring them in, 
And then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Now, Nebuchadnezzar is an interesting person. And if you go back to Jeremiah chapter 27, verses 5, beginning with verse 5, you find Jeremiah prophesying concerning Nebuchadnezzar. Thus saith the Lord, verse 4 of hosts, the God of Israel, Thus shall you, shall you say to your masters, I have made the earth, the man and the beast that are upon the ground, by my great power and by my outstretched arm. And I have given it unto whom it seemed fit unto me. And now have I given all of these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, God says. And the beasts of the field have I given him also to serve him, and all nations shall serve him, and his son and his son's son. Interestingly enough, that's just how far it went. To his son, and then to his son's son, who was Belshazzar. And of course it was Belshazzar who perished at the hands of the Medo-Persians when the Babylonian Empire fell and the Medo-Persian Empire took over. So, interesting prophecy, because again, the exactness of it, I gave it to him, to his son, and to his son's sons. And that was it. That's how far she went. So, until the very time of his land come, and then many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of him. The many nations, of course, the Medo-Persians and the kings, Cyrus and Darius and so forth, uh, they would then conquer, which, of course, did happen. But notice God said, I've given it to Nebuchadnezzar. And God calls Nebuchadnezzar his servant because God used Nebuchadnezzar as his instrument of judgment. It isn't because Nebuchadnezzar was a righteous man but he became God's instrument of judgment against the nations. And so Jer Ezekiel prophesies the destruction of Tyre, as does Jeremiah and of the other nations, which were conquered by Nebuchadnezzar because God had ordained that he would be the instrument of judgment. But after he became the instrument of judgment, then he also, or Babylon also, was judged. And so God... They were brought before Nebuchadnezzar, uh, whom God had set in his position of power and authority. Now, as we move into the book of Nebuchadnezzar, we will find where God <laughs> teaches Nebuchadnezzar the fact that it was God who placed him in that position. He began to be lifted up with pride because of the glory of the Babylonian kingdom. He, he began to say, is this not the great Babylon that I have made? And God says, well, I'll teach you a lesson. And he did, and we'll get to that. It's a fascinating lesson. <laughs> you know, there are important things for you to know. Lessons that you need to learn. And you can learn them the easy way, or you can learn them the hard way. And a lot of people are stubborn and thus they have to learn the hard way. It's painful to learn those lessons. But the lessons are so important. You see, your life depends upon your learning these lessons. Jonah needed to learn an important lesson. That God's way is the best and the right way that God knows best for your life. And Jonah, when God told him what he wanted to do, thought that Jonah knew better than God. God said, go to Nineveh. Jonah said, I'm going to Tarshish. 
But he learned an important lesson the hard way. And I have been as Jonah in certain lessons that God had to teach me. And it's not easy to learn lessons the hard way, but the lessons are so important, I must learn them. And so God in his love is going to teach me the lesson. And if I am attentive and obedient, I can learn lessons the easy way. And that's great. But if I think I know better, then God will teach me the lesson. But oh, it hurts. It's painful. But whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. See, if God didn't love you, he'd just let you go. He'd let you destroy yourself. He'd let you mess yourself up completely. But he loves you. And whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. He'll teach you. He'll chasten you as a teaching method in order to teach you his ways. Nebuchadnezzar learned the lesson that it was God who gave him his authority, his position, that God sets on the throne those whom he wills. He learned it. Oh, man, but what a hard way. We'll get to that. In all of the matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, they, they came before and they, they were, it was a, sort of an inquisition. The king began to ask them questions, testing them. And in all of the questions, the matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired or questioned them, he found them ten times better than all of the magicians and the astrologers that were in all of his realm. These guys were shining lights. Just young boys. But because of the Spirit of God upon them, the anointing of God upon their lives, they were ten times better than all the rest. Now, the Bible declares that the natural man does not understand the things of the Spirit, neither does he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. Thus it is totally worthless to go to Orange Coast College or USC or any other university and take a Bible course from some Ph.D., who is not born again. Because the natural man does not understand the things of the Spirit and neither can he know them. Though he may understand the Hebrew and the Greek and may know all of the grammar and the tenses and the whole bit, if he is not born again, he is, a, he is not capable of teaching the Word of God. You would be much better off to go and listen to just some simple minister of Jesus Christ who is filled with the Spirit and maybe has only a sixth grade education, doesn't know Greek from hen scratches, but walks in the Spirit and lives in fellowship with God. I used to have a lady in my church who'd had only a sixth grade education. But this lady lived close to the Lord, walked in the Spirit. And she would oftentimes come up to me and she'd say, she called me Brother Smith. She said, you know, I was reading here in Galatians the other day and the Lord spoke to my heart and I saw this and it was just so beautiful. Well, 
It happened to be that I had been studying Galatians and I'd been using my Greek New Testament and looking at, you know, the whole Greek. And I got the same truth. It was great. I, I was able to get it by digging it out of the Greek, you know, and I thought, you know, it's great to have a working knowledge of the Greek language so you can get these things. And here she comes up and with the same truth. I said, Lord, that's not fair. All of that miserable studying of Greek. I hated Greek. I labored through Greek. And here God brings to her the same truths. Reveals them by his spirit. And I used to just enjoy talking to her. Because God had given her such beautiful spiritual insights because she just walked in close fellowship with the Lord. And so Daniel and his friends had it all over these other guys. Ten times wiser in the matters because of God's Spirit, because of their hearts that were purposed that they were going to serve God. They weren't going to defile themselves, but they were going to live a life of fellowship with God, pleasing unto God. Tremendous examples. A lot to learn from these four young men who stood fast in the face of temptation in a foreign land were living there. They had all of the opportunities to avail themselves of the uh, glamour and the uh, favors that they could obtain by being there in the king's court. And yet their hearts were committed to the Lord completely. And God bless them for it. Even as God will bless you as you commit your heart completely and fully to him. Father, we thank you for the examples that we have in these four young men. For the purpose of their heart to keep themselves unspotted untainted by the pleasures and the delicacies of the world who determined that they were going to live lives that would please you. Lord, may we make that same kind of a commitment in our heart that we will stand fast against the opposition of the enemy or the enticements of the enemy, that we will live a life holy unto thee. And Lord, we pray that our hearts might be open to be instructed by your Spirit, to be guided into all truth, that you, Lord, would be our instructor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand? Next Sunday night we get into, you know, the, the juicy portion of Daniel as we move immediately into the prophetic sections of the book. And... Uh, we see these marvelous predictions of uh, the future world-governing empires. And uh, it takes us through the history and into the yet future. So uh, we will be moving next week into Daniel 2. Study it over, get some commentaries, read uh, about it, and, and let the Spirit of God just really minister to you through this marvelous book of Daniel. May the Lord give you a wonderful week and just fill your heart with his love. 
until it just overflows. And may the Lord help you to keep your mind stayed on Him when there are so many distractions and so many things this week to take your mind away from the Lord. Pressures. But may your mind and heart be stayed on Him. May He be the center of your focus. And may you just know the joy of His presence and of His power working in your lives. Our Father